there, Reconcile Church. Pastor Kevin here, back with another installment in our Doctrine series. Uh, as I say every week, what we're doing is we're taking our Statement of Faith, the New Hampshire Confession of Faith, and we're going article by article explaining it so you have a clearer understanding of things. Uh, now we get to week 16, which is out of, I believe, 18 of these things, so we're almost there, almost done with them. Uh, this one looks at the role of the civil government. Now, as I say this, this is probably one of the more controversial ones simply because of the day and age we live in. It's November 2020, uh, and we're in the middle of a weird situation uh, where the, sep the, the ideas of separation of church and state um, are being blurred in a lot of ways where they haven't been before. And to be honest with you, when we talk about some of these ideas, especially uh, obedience or submission to governing authorities, um, there's something in us, I think, by nature that pushes back a little. Um, and because of who we are, uh, we're Protestants, okay? So protesting is something kind of that comes naturally to us. We're Baptists, so we believe in a lot of congregational freedom. And uh, we're Americans, so we love our liberty, we love our freedoms, and all those things are good, and I don't apologize for those things. However, we can sometimes look at the issue and get uh, short-sighted on these things. We can miss the fact uh, that there's also, uh, the Bible acknowledges leaders, it, it acknowledges hierarchies, and it acknowledges people in authority that we are called to obey and submit to. So, with that said, let's get into the article, and I'm going to unpack it. Uh, a little bit, by the way, just a note, uh, because we're in kind of a unique situation, uh, it's 2020 and uh, issues in politics have run uh, pretty crazy. I am working on an additional kind of video follow-up on some of the, on the biblical roles of government and things like that to talk about further. Uh, there's more to be said here than I'm going to be able to say in this little, you know, hopefully 15 to 25 minute uh, discussion. We'll see how long it goes, but... With that said, let's get into it. Article 16 of the Civil Government. We believe that the civil government is of divine appointment for the interests and good order of human society and that magistrates are to be prayed for, conscientiously honored, and obeyed, except only in things opposed to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only Lord of the conscience and the Prince of the Kings of the Earth. Okay, so... A lot to be said here. Let me jump into it. Um, I've got four, basically four points that I want to kind of highlight here, explain how they relate to uh, this section, and show you how I believe these things are biblical. So first idea I want to throw out to you guys. God places leaders in civil government. They have, therefore, delegated authority. Okay, so the idea that the Bible always places is that God has ultimate authority. He's sovereign over all. He is Lord of all heaven and earth. Uh, and so all nations are ultimately subject to God. Uh, all, all people are ultimately subject to God. We believe that one day uh, we will, everyone will have to stand before their maker and give an account for the things they've done. Because God is the Lord and judge of, of all things. So, he's Lord over all, however... God also delegates certain authority. And specifically, in relation to what we're talking about today, he put he delegates authority to uh, leaders in civil government. Um, now, when we talk about this, this we could be referring to this in a lot of different ways. Um, in biblical times, they didn't have the same kind of system of government we had. Uh, Israel originally uh, functioned in... Uh, probably a way that's maybe even more maybe more similar to uh, American government than some of the empires that came after them. Uh, they each tribe each tribe uh, existed as part of a greater nation um, and they appointed judges and things like that which we'll talk about. Uh, then came David and they appointed a king which was not actually a good thing we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, the people of Israel would have been taken captive and taken into exile under the Babylonians, the, Med uh, the, the Medes, the Persians, uh, and the Romans, and so on and so forth. Um, and so we have to understand that in all these things, whatever that system of government is, they, did not, they do not come to power 
outside of God's will. That doesn't mean necessarily that everything they do is good or to be approved of. But it is to say that God is still Lord of all, even in situations of oppressive uh, authorities. So let me give you an example. Daniel. I'm going to reference Daniel a lot today. Daniel chapter 2. Uh, we read this. Verse, uh, starting in verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. Verse 21, this is what I want you to focus on. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Okay? Now this is helpful because basically these words come during a time when the people have been conquered and many carried away into captivity to the pagan kingdom of Babylon. Babylon was not a Christian nation. It was an absolutely wicked nation. And so even in the midst of that, we have this acknowledgement that God sets up kings, God brings down kings, okay? They don't come to power and they don't fall from power without uh, God's will. So in that instance, what we're reminded of is, is this idea that even ungodly, uh, godless uh, kings have come to power because God put them there for his purpose, which we're about to get into. Now, like I said, that doesn't mean... There's a couple things it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean they have absolute authority. It doesn't mean that uh, one of the things I'm working on uh, is we look at governments as the Bible acknowledges multiple systems of governing authorities. Uh, to put it really simply, uh, there's self-government, uh, there's family, go there's familial government, uh, there is ecclesiastical government, and there is civil government. Now, I'm working on that right now, so uh, that will be more forthcoming. But, so they have, because they have designated authority the question is who designates the authority who defines that authority and the answer is god so next thing i have for you guys civil government has a purpose so since god appoints rulers he also sets the parameters and the limits on their authority notice what the confession says here that the civil magistrate has been appointed for a purpose it says for the interests and good order of human society Civil government has a specific function in society, and that purpose is defined by the one who gave them that authority. What's the, uh, what is it, what, 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 how do they describe it? It's described as the good order of society. Now, when we talk about that, the good order of society isn't determined by the rulers of that society. It's determined by God. After all, he is alone good and perfect, so true goodness is is defined in reference to him. When we talk about what's the good order of society, a lot of wicked men and a lot of wicked rulers have defined goodness on a lot of evil terms. We don't just import that and say, well, you know what, because they say this is good, this must be good, we therefore acknowledge it. No, 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 no. The Bible defines who we are as people. It defines, it defines the role of people, the role of fathers and wives and children and also the roles of government. So, how does the Bible describe that? Well, in order specifically, what we, see, what we see in the Bible is that the way the state is to reflect God's character, his goodness, is by demonstrating his justice, okay? Civil government is primarily concerned with justice. This is how, this is how, they, in, this is how they display God's goodness to the world. They've been given authority in order to uh, uphold justice in society. Now, let me give you a passage from this, uh, about this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. This is how Peter talks. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so when, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And then notice this, verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the governor or to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. 
For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Notice that Peter calls upon the language of exile here. We just looked at the exile with the, with uh, Daniel. Now, it's not that the people were actually exiled in the same way that the Israelites were, but Peter wants to bring to mind this same kind of idea. You're not necessarily on your home turf in the way uh, among the Gentiles, uh, similar to how Daniel wasn't on uh, Israelite land. He wasn't in the kingdom of Israel when he lived in Babylon. Uh, so same idea here. Part of so and so as as such, he ta outlines certain things. Uh, part of resisting sinful passions or doing and doing good deeds and glorifying God is about being subject to human institutions, specifically human institutions of government. Uh, Christians are going to be accused of certain things anyway. Notice here that he actually he actually gives that as a as like that's just a given. Like people are going to speak evil of you. He says he says that idea so that um, when they speak evil against you as evildoers. So Christians are going to be accused of doing evil whether they do so or not. He says, but when they do this, not if. Uh, that you don't give them a reason for this. You don't bring give them reasons to bring extra charges against you. This is for God's glory and also for our own protection. See, people, uh, if you look at Jesus uh, in, in the Gospels, uh, one of the things that happens is at Jesus' trial is that uh, the Pharisees and, the, and such try to create all these trumped-up charges on him. Uh, they try to get all these false charges against Jesus in order to bring it up. But what happens is they, they, they're, they're false uh, charges, and so their testimony isn't valid. Um, this is the same kind of way God calls us to interact with the world around us. He says, when people try to bring you against them and have, try to have charges against you, uh, be of good conduct in such a way that they can't just bring those charges against you. Um, although we've been called to freedom, and that freedom involves uh, serving God and following him and all that, uh, we don't simply have the right to just um, disobey any law that we, that we don't like. Um, specifically, the, what the Bible would look at in regards to this, uh, it likes to point out taxes. Um, the Romans had an, un, a, an unbiblical means of taxation. They taxed more than was expected to, uh, uh, than, was, uh, than they should have. Uh, we live in a time uh, where we are taxed more than we should be uh, based on biblical guidelines. Um, however, do, there, do we just go, oh, nuts that I'm not paying those, un those ungodly taxes? No, 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 no. We do for the sake of not bringing, so that people can't bring a charge against us. Because ultimately, our calling and our mission is to glorify God and to share the gospel with others. And he says, so don't give, the, don't give your, basically don't give your enemies a foothold. Or a foot, uh, yeah. Uh, don't give them uh, a grounds to uh, accuse you of, other than the fact that there's going to be things that they will accuse you of. But under, So even though don't give them a reason to accuse you of something, however, understand also that they are going to accuse you of something. The Bible talks about both those things. Now, uh, when the Bible talks about these things, uh, what often gets missed in this is that this passage also outlines the role of the civil, civil government and the role they play in society. Did you catch it? Let me bring it out for you. Peter says that governors are sent to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Government is to preserve justice and to promote good behavior. Now, specifically, they do this by punishing injustice, wrongdoing, or crimes. Um, like I said, I'm working on an extended video lesson on this. It's going to take a little time. I'm trying to get all my thoughts together on this, but I promise there's more to say about this. But the idea here is government punishes evil and government, uh, and is meant to, uh, promote good, goodness in essence. Uh, we find the same purpose outlined in the Old Testament as well. So here we're, we, when we look at Israel, that's the same idea. Deuteronomy chapter 16 verses 18 through 20. 
It talks about the appointment of judges. It says, You shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, according to your tribes, that they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. You shall not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Verse 20, Justice and only justice you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Civil government has divinely given authority, divine, divinely appointed authority, in order to punish crime and restore justice. Um, I have mentioned this recently in a sermon, that biblical justice is based on restitution. So if someone stole something, they pay it back with a little interest for the trouble they caused. If someone takes a life, they pay with a life. That's biblical justice. And in the way, and, and by punishing those who do wrong, uh, they are, the civil government is restoring justice. Uh, they are making sure that, the, the, that society works in a just and right way. And by doing this, they all, not only are they uh, discouraging wrongdoing or criminal activity, they're promoting good deeds and right living. So that's the idea, the role of civil government. Next idea I have for you guys. We should respect, pray for, and obey our civil governments. Uh, Peter said it here. He says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and then honor the emperor. Uh, notice that it's interesting that he singles out the emperor here. Because, the, because in Israel, they had no place for an emperor in the Old Testament law. In fact, when Israel asked for a king, this was something that God looked down upon. He tells Samuel that they did this, they did so because they wanted to be like the other pagan nations. And in doing so, they, have, they had actually rejected him, God, as being their king. So this isn't, an, this isn't uh, emperor is not like a, uh, is not a, is not a, a thing that God's like, hey, here's a good idea, have emperors. Uh, no, it's a horrible idea. Um, as a matter of fact, he mentions that in, in um, Samuel, uh, that by appointing those people for those things, they're going to oppress you uh, it, because you have re rejected, uh, ultimately in appointing those people, it's also a rejection of God and his authority um, over your life. Um, it's a refusal to be self-governed in some way. Now, regardless of whether a person was a good or bad believer, believers are called upon to respect, or the word they use here, honor leaders in particular. Now, the words that we translate honor here refer to weighing something. Particularly, this would be used of like weighing out gold or other precious minerals to see how much value they had. To honor someone, therefore, is to treat them as though they had substance or weight or force to them. Um, basically, a stone is heavier than a snowball. If uh, I know this is Vegas, and so we don't really have snow, but let's assume that, like, you know, you walk outside your door one day, and there's a neighborhood kid, and they have a snowball, and they fling it at you. You might just be like a person who's like, oh, whatever, boom, lets it hit you and lets it roll off you. Why? Because the snowball doesn't have a lot of weight to it. However, you walk out your door, same kid's sitting there, and he's got a rock in his hand, and he flings it at you. If you've got any sense, you're going to move away or duck or put up your hands or whatever. Why? Because the thing has more weight to it. And, and as because it has more weight to it, it is to be treated different, differently. The same thing is true, true of leaders in authority. They carry weight to them. As they we're told in the scriptures, they bear the sword. They're God's means of punishing wrongdoing. And since they have divine authority to actually punish wrongdoing, they should, they should be treated wrongly. Uh, with the way, according to the weight that they carry, okay? That's what honor means. And so one of the things, too, when you look at, um, this isn't just true of American society or anything. It's probably true of all societies. When you look at people who have positions of power and authority of their people, that could be politicians or it could be roles like police officers, things like that. Um, police officers would be a form of the civil magistrate and to some extent. They, they actually go out and punish crime. Um, when you look at those things, generally people tend to rip on those people. Generally, we have people tend to look down on those people in society. But here, that's not to be the case. Uh, rather, we're supposed to look to, to we're supposed to treat uh, those people in authority with honor, with respect. 
and uh, we shouldn't be people who simply disregard them lightly. We shouldn't be people who treat them, uh, who mock them, uh, uh, or anything like that. We should be respectful of people in the in, in that position. Uh, let me give you another passage: First Timothy chapter two, verses one through four. The Apostle Paul writes, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of our God and Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So, politicians, police officers, others in civil government, as I said, they're often kind of the but of everyone's jokes. Paul reminds us here that they are not somehow second-class citizens. God desires all people, that is, all types of people, to be saved. He Not only uh, does God want uh, people in low positions to be saved, he wants people in high positions to be saved. And not only that, but because of that high position, uh, peace with them allows us to pursue a godly life of service uh, to him, and promote it promotes... Uh, basically, having a favorable, uh, peaceful life uh, promotes the ability to share the gospel with less fear of opposition. Um, there'll be some opposition, but we, but honestly, if the government has our back on those things, it's helpful and it's good. Uh, I'm thankful for the fact that we live uh, in the nation we live in uh, because we have freedom of religion, uh, and so there's. Uh, at least for this time being, there is uh, a fear of persecution that every Christian does not have to be afraid of. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be afraid uh, that they're going to get arrested for being a believer or jailed or even put to death for being a believer. Now, that may not last forever, and there's certainly perhaps uh, signs that maybe some of that stuff uh, is passing away, and so we may have to have those concerns. But the goal that Paul says to pray for is, one, you know, God wants everybody to be saved, so pray for those people, those kings and those rulers and those people in authority, uh, that you, because God desires uh, them too to be saved, but also because it allows you to live the life God has called you to live in service to him without fear of, op without fear of op a government opposition. The goal isn't to be revolutionaries. It's to live a quiet life of service to God. That's a good thing. Now, with that said, it brings us to the last uh, uh, last point I have, which is when basically when should we disobey the government? And that's my fourth point. The government's law cannot overrule God's law. So there are times when the state may infringe upon God's commands. In these cases, we should echo the words of the apostle Peter, who wrote, who we read in Acts chapter five, verse twenty nine. He says, "We must obey God rather than man." That is a command. When the, law, when, when the law of man and the law of God contradict each other, always go with God Don't worry, and don't feel as though you are being a sinner by doing that. And don't let anyone tell you you're being a sinner by doing that. You are commanded to obey God first and foremost. He is Lord over all. And so, like I said, leaders have delegated authority. God sets the extent of their power and authority, their rule, and when rulers set themselves up against God's law, his word, his commands, what they've essentially done is overstep their bounds. Now, for example, if we st uh, let me give you a current issue and a current topic that applies to this. Um, there are governors out there who uh, have said churches should not, uh, that we, this is 2020. There are people who said churches should not gather for a season. Now, as a church, we did stay at home for a little while uh, because we wanted to be cautious about uh, the coronavirus. We didn't know much about it then, and we were being told a lot of things that it was just like basically uh, the like the bubonic plague or something. Um, it's a serious issue, but it's not quite that we're it's not quite there either, and we know that now, and we can see that now. Um, but we didn't close down because the government told us to close down. Um, we stopped meeting for a period of weeks um, to be sure of this, one, to, re to be respectful um, because of the risk involved. However, the government cannot force churches closed for a very simple reason. It's not in their authority. Um, keeping uh, Paul, or the writer of Hebrews um, talks about this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. He says, 
Uh, he reminds the church not to not neglect meeting together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So meeting together is a command. It is a call in Scripture. Sabbath keeping is the fourth commandment. The government does not have the authority to tell churches not to gather, and so you are not sinning by disobeying them in gathering together as a church. Rather, you are simply being obedient to a higher authority. Um, let me give you another great example, which kind of brings our story full circle. Uh, if we go to Daniel chapter 6, in the story, Daniel has risen to prominence amongst the, the king's officials, uh, and basically they don't like this. Daniel's about to get put in charge of almost everything, and the other officials don't like it. So they want to get Daniel arrested. They want to get him out of power. So how do they do this? Well, they come up with a scheme. Uh, interestingly enough, it, it, just like we read in First Peter, we find that they couldn't find any like charges in their own law to bring up against him. Daniel chapter 6, uh, verse 4 and 5 says, They could find no ground for complaint or any fault, because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Verse 5, These men th then said, we shall, find no, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with with the law of his God. So these jealous officials realize they can't get Daniel on any of their laws, so they intentionally try to form, uh, to create a law which violates biblical law in order to trap Daniel. So what they basically do, they convince the king, King Darius, to make a law where no one can pray to anyone but him for a month. Now, this is a violation of God's law. Prayers are a form of worship, and the first commandment tells us to worship the Lord our God alone. So Daniel's in a predicament here. He has to, if he obeys this law, he's in violation of God's law. So he must choose whom he will serve. So what does Daniel do? Well, chapter 6, verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document, that's the law they're talking about, had been signed, it's been put into play, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees and three times a day prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Now, one of the things that should stand out to us here is that Daniel's defiance here isn't something that he is secret about. He doesn't move his prayers into, he was, he was already in the habit of doing this, and so he doesn't just move his prayers into, like, you know, his closet or underneath his bed or something. I understand he probably didn't have closets or beds at this time or whatever. I'm, I don't know what <laughs> the culture looked like in that sense. But basically, he does this, he continues to pray, and he prays publicly. He finds the top, he goes up to the top floor of his home, and in view of the windows, he prays, and he doesn't just pray once, he prays three times every day. Why? Because the law, the law that was put into place is evil, and he doesn't need to pretend that it is anything but evil. Truth be told, nowadays, guys, I feel like if this kind of law, if there was a law like this put into place, that there would be plenty of Christian teachers and writers trying speaking about how disrespectful and disobedient men like Daniel would be uh, for simply disobeying this law. He wasn't he wasn't being uh, he wasn't being disrespectful. He was being respectful, but he was being ultimately respectful to God over men. When men set themselves up against the word of God, we stand with God and his word and we are right in doing so. So that's our position on civil government. As I said before, there's more to be said about this, and I'm working on this, but this should at least give you a basic framework to see what we're working with. Well, that said, guys, we're almost done with our doctrine series. We've been doing this now for 16 weeks, so basically four months or so. I hope it's been beneficial. We have two more weeks to go. Um, I will be back here next week with, the next, with our second to last week in our doctrine series. Guys, God bless, and have a great week.